All right, welcome back to the counting slides. Let's keep going on them. We should be able to finish them up today. So I want to start off with a question for you, and this one's about counting multisets again. So if we go back to last time, remember how to count multisets. You imagine that everything's like a big binary string, where the ones are the things that you take, and the zeros are the separators between categories. And so we're trying to count the number of ways to select n objects from a set of m varieties and the, the final formula that we discover look like, looked like this. Uh, so keep that and try this. So here's the example. Let's pretend that we have coins sitting in piles and we have an infinite amount of coins in each pile, at least 25 of each. Uh, according to, so each, each pile has pennies, got a penny pile, a nickel pile, a dime pile, and a quarter pile. And the first question is how many ways are there to select 25 coins from the piles? And my hint to you is remember to make that binary string. Like let's say we we take three pennies, then you put a zero to mark that I'm done taking pennies. And maybe I take four nickels, and then you put a zero to mark that you're done taking nickels. And then I don't know one, two, three, four, five dimes, and then the rest are kind of forced to be quarters at that point. But that's the kind of style that you're gonna. That's the kind of binary string that you're gonna make, and this is the formula to, to worry about that idea. So that's part A, try that. And then part B is, how many ways are there to select 25 coins if at least five of those coins must be quarters? All right, so you're forcing five to be quarters. It could be any five quarters though, because we're assuming, as we do with multi-sets, that every quarter is the same as every other quarter. The order in which we take quarters does not matter. They are all indistinguishable, equally nice and shiny, okay? So that is your question. Give that a try. And so this this first one just boils down to the standard counting multisets problem, where we have well, we have n things, n is 25, uh, 25 things to select, and m is the number of uh, different categories that we can choose from. We have four categories: pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. And so if we just plug this in to our formula, which was n plus m minus one, oops. choose m minus 1, then we have an answer. So it's uh, 29, 28, choose 3. Those are all the ways to select 25 coins from the piles in any way, which is kind of cool. So that's part A. And then part B is this. How many ways are there to select 25 coins if at least five, and five of the coins must be quarters? So the idea is how many ways are there? Like we're kind of, we have to force ourselves to ourselves to pick five quarters at least. And how many ways are there to pick five quarters, assuming that quarters are indistinguishable? Well, there's only one way to do it: just grab five quarters. I hope that makes sense. And then you're going to multiply that by all the the ways to select the rest of the coins. If you forced five to be quarters, then you can only really you 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 only really have a choice of twenty coins. Does that make sense? So, the the only thing that matters here is you selecting the 20 other coins. You forced five of them to be quarters. Uh, so it's one times the number of ways to select 20 coins from the piles. You can take more, more quarters if you want. You've just forced yourself to take five already from the piles. That's the idea. And this is the number of ways to pick five quarters, assuming they're all indistinguishable. Just grab a handful of five. You got. You're done. There's only one way to do it. Only one way to pick five quarters. And so your choice only lies in picking 20 other things. If you forced yourself to do something, this is very similar to the lining people up for a photograph. Like you've made the choice that the bride and the groom are going to be next to each other. Where was that example? I can't remember. Uh, it's one of these up here this one kind of goes back to that idea. you treat what you want as a unit there's only one way to keep them all together just treat them like one big thing treat all those quarters as one thing that's pretty much it and so what is this 20 20 coins from four piles it's gonna be well now n is 20 so it's 20 plus 4 minus 1 choose 4 minus 1 again which is uh, 23 choose 3 so Less options, of course, because you have fewer coins to choose from, really. Uh, so that's A and B. Please yell at me if you have any questions about that. Hopefully that's making at least a little bit of sense. 
All right, let's talk about counting sets now when there is overlap, because that is very important, usually, right? Uh, when you're counting sets, like the size of a certain union of sets, right? If the sets don't overlap, it's very easy. Like here's set one, here's set two. They don't have any overlap. They don't touch each other. You want to count all the things in them, just count the things in S1, add them to the things in S2. That's fine. But the issue lies, so this is the normal equation, but there is an issue when they do have overlap. You can't just add S1 and S2 because if S1 and S2 look like this, you've double counted this stuff, right? You've double counted the stuff in the middle. And the fancy term for not counting the thing in the middle twice is called the principle of inclusion exclusion. It's how you can count a union. It's a generalized way of counting uh, unions of sets. We'll just talk about two sets right now, though. Uh, and so if we have two finite sets, then in general, this is the right answer. Right? The union, the size of their union is the size of the first plus the size of the second. And we've double counted because like we add all these, then we add all these again. So we double counted this in the middle there. We just have to remove one of the middle pieces, which is their intersection. Right? So subtract one copy of the intersection, and that's the true amount. Okay? That's the principle of inclusion exclusion. That is how you can count sets that are arbitrary and of course this equation falls out of it because if they're if the sets don't share any overlap then the size of their overlap is of course zero so here is just an example of that like here's set a i don't know it's got one two three four five six things and here's set b it shares some things with a and it's got uh, five things total though and so the size of a union b is you know that it's uh six seven eight nine but you can get that from size of A, which is 6, plus the size of B, which is 5, minus the size of their intersection. So that tells you how much was overlapping and how much you double counted. So minus the 2, right? The 2 that was overlapped. So that's the idea. That's how that works. This idea can be generalized to multiple sets where there are a bunch of different kinds of overlap. I think you can imagine it gets a little weird once you have multiple sets that may all share things or just like share a piece with some of these guys, share a piece with two of these guys share, and then all three of them share certain amounts, like that gets crazy. And so the formula gets more disgusting as you get larger, uh, but it looks like this. You add A, B, and C, and then you subtract the intersections of pairs of things, of A and B, A, B and C, and then A and C. And then uh, it turns out that you've uh, not double counted the very, very middle where they all share things. Uh, you've actually taken it away, and so you need to bring it back. So you have to add all the combinations of three things. And so there's, uh, there's a pattern to it. Uh, go feel free to look in the book or on Wikipedia, but that's, that's as far as I care about you learning right now. Uh, you can prove with induction, though, that this, this kind of general pattern that maybe you see holds. So that's the idea. That's inclusion, exclusion, count and stuff. Uh, let's also talk about generating permutations, because eventually, like, this is a computer science class. We have to bring this back to code. And so let's talk about generating all of maybe the different permutations and combinations. I think... Uh, am I going to show you that now, or am I going to show you that next slide? I think I'm going to show it to you now, if I remember correctly. So first of all, a lot of times we would like to generate all the permutations in a nice cute order. Uh, one nice order is called lexicographic order. That's how strings are uh, ordered inside of C++, for example, or just how words are ordered in the dictionary. Lexicographic order just means dictionary order. Uh, and so like, in C++ or in a dictionary, ABC would come before BCD, obviously, and then ABC would come before ABD. It just like, if there's overlap, just go to the first thing that's not matching which one comes first. And this gets a little weird because you have ASCII values. It's really comparing ASCII values. And so it, it turns out that the string percent sign happens to be less than the string uh, open paren, but don't worry too much about that. That's just an extension of dictionary order, but uh, kind of makes sense. There are some very nice algorithms, though, to generate all the permutations. Like, you give it a set, it'll give you back all of the permutations or all the combinations of a set in lexicographic order, which is nice. And so this is uh, a future lab where you will be doing this, your last lab in the class, in fact. 
so that uh, that's where we're going. We would like to make a program that can generate all the different permutations or combinations of a set. All right, and oops, where, where was I? Here we go. So here's the algorithm to generate all the permutations of just a set of numbers. We're going to assume that uh, this is the function we're going to call gen, gen lex permutation. So generate all the permutations of a certain set given by n uh, in lexicographic order. And when you give it the n, what it means is it's just going to assume the set it's trying to calculate all the permutations of generate all permutations of it's supposed to mean like the set one, two, three, all the way to n. So n represents the size of the set, and it will give you back things in this uh, permutations of this kind of set. And you can use that to generate permutations of anything that you have. Uh, just like use these as indices into your string or into your vector or whatever you're trying to permute. All right, so that is the idea. You gen lex permutation that gets an n, which means the size of the set, and it's going to give you back permutations of the numbers one through n. Okay. And the way this one works, this is the easy one. Uh, it's going to call a harder function. That'll take some time to explain, though. But what it does is it initializes all the permutations. It's going to have a variable that stores all the permutations. The first permutation of these numbers in lexicographic order is they just, just put them in order, 1, 2, all the way down. OK, so that's fine. And so print that one. And then forever and ever and ever until while while that permutation is not the last one right the the last one is where like this is numbers but i think you can imagine that a b c and uh, all the way to z is the first permutation just think of that like that and then z uh, y x all the way to a is the last permutation that's why the numbers in decreasing order is supposed to mean the last permutation and while it's not that one keep on calculating the next permutation given the one you just made and then output that. And so it's just going to go in every time, make the next permutation in lexicogra lexicographic order. OK, and this hopefully makes enough sense. It just keeps on updating the next permutation, the next permutation. And this is what generates the next permutation. And this is the hard one. All right. So uh, let me just explain it in words and then I'll walk you through uh, with an example. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about this. So next perm takes your current permutation and produces the next one in lexicographic order, dictionary order. All right, so let's let's try and uh, explain it. So what you're going to do is you're going to look for indices. It's very important. So let k be the largest index such that p of k is less than p of k plus one. So for all of these indices. Go and find the biggest one, the one over here to the right, such that uh, the one before is less than the one after. That's going to be the one that you end up like swapping, essentially. Uh, and so if, if one doesn't exist, like you shouldn't have called next perm, it was the last permutation. Uh, assuming it all worked out, you've got your k now. And now find j. j is an index again, the rightmost index where you have two elements that are uh, one is the one that is in j is bigger than the one in k at the index k that you just found here. And those are the two that you'll be swapping. Uh, you'll swap the values of the permutation at index j and k. And then you'll reverse p of k plus 1 all through n. So like if this was k right here, you'll reverse the rest of these. And then that will be your new permutation. You return that. OK, so that probably made no sense at all. So let's let's see it work on some examples. All right, so let's watch next perm do its thing, uh, assuming n is five. So let's let's say it's like we started off. We have next perm and we give it. Uh, let's just say we give it the starting permutation one through five, assuming we're trying to c compute the permutations of the set containing all the numbers from one to five. So it's going to start off with this one one two three four five, and these are all these all have indices, right? And they all have indices where I guess one through n is the same as let's just do it how it's gonna be inside of a computer. Let's just do one, zero, one, two, three, and four. Those are the indices in our permutation. And so we're trying to, like we jump inside of next perm, we try to figure out what needs to happen here. And my computer is very uh, loud right now. Let me see what what's dealing what it's trying to deal with. Anti malware. Alright, whatever. Uh, okay. So, uh, 
Yeah, so now we're here. We want to find k, the largest index such that p of k is less than the thing right after it. So we want to find the largest index where, like, if this were k, is this thing less uh, bigger than it? So find the biggest k such that the value of the permutation at that index is smaller than the value right after it. And so, like, they all work. This one's less than this one, two is less than three, three is less than four, four is less than five. So this is the biggest possible k. You see that? This is p of k. So k is three. You see that? This is the biggest k such that p of k plus one is bigger than it. So that's fine. Uh, and now we want to find j. j needs to be the largest index such that p of j is bigger than p of k, the value. Find the rightmost index, so the biggest, uh, the thing to the right as far as possible that is bigger than the four. And so we only have the five. And that is all the way to the right already. So here is our p of j. j is index four. Okay, so now we've got those set up. Watch what happens. Oops. Oh, I got rid of my dot for some reason. So now we have those set up. What we do now is we swap pj and pk. So that, uh, that turns into, uh, we'll just draw it like this. This turns into one, two, three, five, four. Oops, and uh, I guess I wanted to be here, didn't I? And then you reverse the order of all the numbers between uh, p of k plus one and p through n, all indices k plus one onwards. And so it's like, here is k plus one onwards, reverse everything, there's nothing to reverse, it's just keep the four in that spot. All right, and so that is your next permutation. It's the next bigger one after this one. Does that make sense? Like the five is bigger than the four. So in dictionary order, this is the next bigger one, which is kind of cool. And then let's do it all over. Let's do it all over again. Now we have one, two, three, five, four. Let's play this game all over again. So let's say that we like we output that, we come back in the loop when we call next perm on our new permutation, one, two, three, five, four. So again, we find the largest index such that the thing after it is bigger. So it looks like it's the three and the five now, because five and four, four is smaller than five. So this is PK. And then we find the uh, the largest index that has a bigger value than the value at index k, which is going to be the four. Five is the biggest value, but four is the biggest index. Do you see that? That's important. And that's pj. And then remember what we do. We are going to, I guess I'll use a different color. We are going to, let's see here. We are going to swap p of k and p of j. Swap these guys, and that leads to one, two, four, five, three. But uh, we could make an even smaller one that has four right in this position that has one, two, four at the start. And so what you do is the idea is you take k plus one onwards and you s you reverse them. So index k was this third element, and so this is k plus one onwards, we're gonna reverse those. And so our final answer is going to be uh, one, two, four, three, five. You see how that's gonna be the next bigger permutation? And that's the one we get back. And so that's like, this gets all transformed into one, two, four, three, five. And that was the process that led us there. Does that make enough sense? This is the next biggest one and I hope you can kind of see how it's the next biggest one in lexicographic order. Start with that one, then it goes five, four, then it goes four, three, five, and then, then I think you can imagine it goes four, five, three. It'll, it's gonna figure itself out. All right, and so you can generate all of them this way with this algorithm, and that's how you do it. Remember that it's all about indices. JB, the largest index, not the largest value, okay? That's important. So that's that. And so let me try, uh, let me have you try this. Let's pretend that we're making, we're generating permutations of the set one through seven, all those numbers. And let's say we're on this one, five, four, seven, six, three, two, one. What is the next largest one? So please run this algorithm on that, uh, on that current permutation. Okay, so give that a try and then I'll show you my thoughts. Okay, so again, 
we, are, we gotta look for k first. k is the uh, index such that the thing right after, it's the largest index of the rightmost thing, such that the thing right after is bigger. So let's look at these. Nope. Let's just compare. Nope. Yep, that one's bigger. Uh, nope, that one's smaller. Or, yeah, that one's smaller, 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 smaller. So it looks like we only have one option here, and it's this one, the 4 and the 7. So 4, uh, that index is PK. See that? And then we want PJ, which is the, let's see, the largest index such that it holds a bigger value than the value at P. So what's the largest index that has a bigger value than 4? It is the 6. You see that? So this is going to be our pj. And then what do we do? Well, we swap them. We swap them so that we have 5, 6, 7, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then we take from k plus 1 onwards. That's these guys, but in the new one now, of course and we reverse them because these are like in decreasing order. It's usually gonna be the case that they're in decreasing order and you want them to ascend because that's the next smaller one. That's the goal. And so uh, let me just circle those in a clearer way. We're gonna reverse all these guys. And so the next smaller permutation is five, six, one, two, three, four, seven. All right, and so that's going to be the final answer. That's the next smaller permutation, or the next largest permutation. The smallest one is possible that comes after this one. All right, so please yell at me if you have any questions about this stuff. This is hopefully slowly making its way into your brain, though. All right, and you're going to be programming this eventually. All right, uh, that was permutations. Let's generate all the combinations of a set in lexicographic order. And again, this is trying to generate the subsets of a special set with just numbers. You can convert it to anything, generate subsets of anything, at, just by using the numbers that it generates as indices. All right. So what this is doing, you give it two parameters. And so what it's meant to do is to generate, given R and N, generate all the subsets of uh, size R. So the size is important now from the set one to all the way to n again. And so it's it's going to generate subsets. So let's just, pretending that we are outputting size two subsets of all the numbers from one to five, for example, uh, what it would do is it would generate the subset like one five and it would like output that. And it would look like this. Uh, it would not output 5, 1 as well, because that would just be like a permutation, right? We just want one of these copies. So we're generating subsets. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Again, I'll walk you through an example. But that's that's the setup. And again, this is the easy part. It's like, all right, initialize our initial subset to look like this. It is all the numbers from 1 to r this time. OK, 1 to r, that may be smaller than n, potentially. Um, I'll put that because that's the first subset in lexicographic order. And then while it's not equal to, uh, treat this like an array, by the way. Uh, it does have order, even though we're generating subsets. While we do not have uh, the set this, which is like things in reverse order, n minus r plus 1, all the way up to, or it's not in reverse order, but it just goes up to n. Uh, n minus r plus 1 all the way to n. Well, it's not equal to that because that's your last subset. Then make the next the next one, given your current one, and then output that. So it's going to be a loop all over again. And of course, the heavy lifting is done by this next subset function that is just as difficult to understand as the next permutation function. So what it takes is it takes that n again because that tells you like what the values we're picking from are. And then you, it takes your current subset that you've generated last, and it builds the next one in lexicographic order. All right, so that's what goes on. And again, let me just talk about it, and then I'll show you an example. So again, it's going to find the largest index, uh, k again, such that s of k is not less than a value in the set. It's less than n minus r plus k. So it's a special value that it's looking for. So find the largest index that is smaller than that formula. And uh, if, do, if, one, and if one does not exist, then again, you're at the last subset. And you shouldn't have called this. But assuming you're good, uh, here's what you do. 
you take that thing, that index k, you increment it. Then you go through every index from then onwards. Again, it's that idea uh, from index k plus 1 onwards. And you are going to set the value there uh, at that index to be the value of the index before you plus one. So you're, you're not incrementing your own yourself, you're incrementing the person before you and bringing them into you plus one, which is weird. Uh, and so it's going to make an ascending thing again. Uh, and then that's the subset that you've generated. I'll put that. So again, it's a little weird. Let me walk you through it. Let's assume that r is three and n is five. So it's calculating all of the size three subsets of this set, uh, one through five. All right, so here's like we're, we're taking stuff. We're generating subsets from the set one through five, and the subsets are of size three, okay? And so uh, let's talk about that, all right? And so we're gonna initialize our initial subset to be all the numbers from one to r. So that's one, two, three, because r is three. And we wanna keep continuing doing this while s is unequal to n minus r, plus one all the way to n. What, what is that? n minus r plus one, that's two plus one is three all the way to n. So the last subset, which kind of makes sense of size three, is gonna look like in lexicographic order, three, four, five, all right? So that's what that algorithm is telling us. And all right, we're starting with this one. We've got indices, you can think of them as zero, one, two, or indices one, two, three, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to find assuming we're getting called with our initial uh, permutation, or our initial subset that looks like this, what we need to find is the largest index such that the value there is less than n minus r plus k. All right, what is that? n minus r plus k. n minus r plus k. Well, it depends on the index k, of course, but what's n minus r at least? That's going to be 5 minus 3 plus k. All right. So let's let's like figure out our options. So this is like this is our little subset S's S1, S2, S3, I guess. So S1, we, and we're looking for k, right? Index k where S of that index is less than n minus r plus k. So if it were S of one, does it work? It needs to be less than n minus r plus k, and k is one. Is that less than five minus three plus one equals three? Yeah, one is less than three, that's fine. All right, what about S of two? Because that's a bigger index. Is that less than n minus r plus k again? So five minus three plus two, because k is two. That's the index we're considering. Is that less than, uh, what is that? Two plus two is four. Is S two less than four? Yeah, sure it is. All right, what about S three? Is that less than? Let's see, n minus r plus k, five minus three plus k is three this time. And so that's five, is that less than five? Yeah, it sure is. So that's, we're looking for the biggest k, right? The biggest k such that this is true. And it looks like our last one works. k could be three. And so that's s of k. All right, what do we do with s of k? What do we do? We're going to increment the value there increment the value there. So this is going to transform into 1, 2, 4. So we're incrementing this to 4. And then what are we doing? For every index afterwards, we're going to do some stuff, but there are no indices after. After kk is the last index. So we're done. That is the next subset, which kind of makes sense. I think you can imagine that 1, 2, 5 will be the next thing. And let me show that to you. Uh, so again, we're going to find is S1, it's actually, we're always going to compare to the same things. Is S1 less than three? Yeah, it is still. Is S2 less than four? Like, could you make it bigger is really the question that this is asking. This, this algorithm is asking, could you make this thing bigger here at this index? Uh, S2, is it less than four? Yeah, sure. Two is less than four. Is S3 less than five? Yeah. So make it five. So again, this is SK and increment it and do some weird stuff to everything after k, but there is nothing after k. So now this goes one, two, five. And now this is the last possible value here. So now things change, okay? 
So now we, I'll just give you a few runs of the next subsets. Now we call next subset on this thing. What's well, the next one in lexicographic order after that? It's going to be 1, 3 something, but uh, hopefully your intuition will have that make sense. So again, we're looking for the largest index such that the one of these equation hold, equations holds. So S1, could it be bigger? Is it less than 3? Yeah. S2, is it less than 4? Yep. S3, is it less than 5? No. So we're looking for the rightmost index such that one of these equations hold. And it looks like this one, 2, that's less than 4. That's the biggest index uh, that still works. So this one is our SK. And so now watch what happens. Uh, we are going to increment that, that index. So index uh, k, increment the value there. So it goes 1, 3 now. And now we do have stuff. We have indices after k. What do we do? Uh, we say that it's just going to make things go in order. It's going to say the value here, the value the, that this next index has is the value of the one before it plus 1. So the one before it is 3 now. So what goes here is 3 plus 1, so 4. See that? That's the idea. And again, we're going to check, like this is the next subset. And we call the next subset on it. We find the rightmost index such that one of these equations hold. Uh, this one can be, le it's less than 5, so make it larger. This now goes 1, 3, 5. Can you see that? That's the goal. And then, uh, now this is already as big as it can be, uh, but this 3 could increase. So now it's going to be the S of K when we run it all over again. And so it goes 1, 4 now. We increment that, and then what goes afterwards is just the thing before it, plus one, always. And if there were stuff after it, uh, you'd put the thing, like you put this thing plus one. It would next go six, for example. And so I encourage you to give this a try on a larger one, but finally we have one, four, five. So this is four is not less than four, five is not less than five. And now it's actually one's turn to be incremented, to get the next uh, lexicographic ordered, lexicographically ordered subset. So now it goes two, and then what comes here is the thing before it plus one. That's what that loop is doing. And then what goes here is the thing before it plus one. So now it's two, three, four. And that's the next subset. And it's going to go that way. Hopefully you kind of see the pattern to three, four, five. All right. So that's how next subset is working. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Again, it's looking for indices and it's doing some special stuff with it. All right, uh, so that's interesting uh, computer science stuff, I would say. So let's move on to some more mathy stuff. Let's talk about the binomial coefficients, which you have definitely seen before in an algebra class. So let's just talk about them because it kind of has to do with counting, believe it or not. So for example, here is a binomial. It has two things and they're added together and it's taken to a power. And it expands too, if you do like the FOIL method, all that stuff, it's like you could have B three times, sure. Uh, or you could take, it's like something, one of these, it's all combinations of B and O three times, right? Uh, you can take two Bs and one O, you could take, uh, but first the Bs could come first and then, or you could take a B, then, then an O, then another B. So there's, there's different ways to do this. And it could, you could also have taken the O and then two Bs. Like there's a bunch of different ways to do stuff and they're all gonna be there. So like, the fact that you can take two Bs and an O appears three times. You see how that's gonna be expanded? There's one way to make all Bs, there's one way to make all Os, and then there's three ways to make combinations of the others, like two Bs and an O, or one B and two Os. Do you see that? I hope somebody's shown that to you before, but uh, that's kind of cool. Like. This is how you think about it, and it expands to this, and there's a formula for that. Uh, and we just like bring things together because you know multiplication commutes, and so order doesn't matter. The orders of the b's and o's don't matter. We just like bring them all together. We have three b square o or three o b square, whatever order you want to put it in. Uh, order doesn't matter. And so this is really a subset question, isn't it? And uh, there is an order to go along with it. And this one was one three three one. Uh, that were the coefficients for all of those pieces, and those are called the binomial coefficients, and they're, they're worth memorizing. And a nice thing is, these are the same in reverse, so it's, it's kind of hard to mess up. So like you go, go this way, go this way, the binomial coefficients are always, there's an ordering going on, uh, which is fun. And the way that you can calculate 
each of these coefficients, like when you're when you have a binomial to some power and it's being expanded, how can you do it? Well, there really is a subset counting problem going on here. And uh, here it is. Here's the binomial theorem. It tells us this. The binomial coefficient of uh, some number to k power times b to the n minus k power, assuming like you have n things always you have to pick. The, binom the binomial coefficient of this term in the output is n choose k. And because this could go in any order, it's like maybe this was first and this was second. That's going to be equal to n choose n minus k, because it's in reverse as well. And so order doesn't matter, and uh, this value is actually equal to this value, but they're both going to be the coefficient that you want here. All right, and the way that you generate this is if you didn't want to do combinations, you could have used Pascal's triangle. Remember that? It looks like this, and so it's like uh, you got these are really ones, right? These are ones along the sides always. And then in the middle, right, what's going on is, yes, this is two choose one, but it's also equal to the things above it, like take the two things above it and add them. So it's one plus one, and so this must be two. You see that? And then like this one, this next value here is going to be the one plus the two, which is three. That makes three, and this one is going to be the two plus the one, which is another three, and so there is our term. See what's going on there? It's kind of cool. And so that's Pascal's triangle. And you can generate it without having to worry about coefficients or without having to worry about combinations uh, because you could do this kind of math. But the, the secret is that what it's telling you is a, is a strong fact about combinations and how they're built out of smaller combinations. Like a, it is a recursive algorithm for generating a combination, which is kind of cool. Uh, this is Pascal's identity, the number of ways to select a set of k items from a set of n items is equal to the sum of selecting k minus 1 things from n minus 1 items and uh, add that to selecting k things from n minus 1 items, which is kind of cool. And so that's your identity. Out of smaller things, smaller pieces up top, you can build the next bigger one. So this is not only a recursive definition, but it's Pascal's identity. It's why the triangle works, which is really cool. Uh, the word identity, by the way, just means that things are the same. They have the same identity. They are equal. Uh, and so that's that's the idea. And I want to prove that to you. Uh, I think, yeah, I want to prove it to you. Let me prove to you Pascal's identity, that n choose k is equal to n minus 1 choose k minus 1 plus n minus 1 choose k. And here is essentially the proof. Let's pretend that we are counting all of the different k subsets, right? That's what we want. k subsets of a set 1 through n, a1 through an, so n things total. So that's, that's like the setup, of course. And then here's what I'm going to show you. Here's what I'm going to prove to you. The number of k subsets of a can be split in a certain way, all right? So let's. Uh, can be split by it can be split on one of the values and let me let me use an example to prove that to you so this is this is kind of hand wavy but you can make this very precise let's pretend that k is 3 and n is 5 because we like those examples and so our original set is of size 5 and so like we've got five things in it 1 2 3 4 5 and we're making all the subsets of size uh, 3 out of this size 5 set and the idea is we're trying to generate all of the length k subsets of this set here, all right? And the, the idea is that you can, you can split, you can split the answer on a value. Let's say that we pick five to split on, and you can split the, the k subsets of this giant set into all of the length k subsets, right? Either, like, we're trying to, at the end of the day, produce size 3 subsets, and we're going to split on 5. So either the size 3 subset that we're generating has a 5 in it, or it doesn't. Let's consider those separately. That's the proof. So uh, either there is uh, a 5 or a non-5. All right, so we can split this into the length k subsets, 
that contain? A n, which is, let's pretend that to be five. And so it's like, all right, length three subsets that contain the five. We have one, two, five. <coughs> Excuse me. We have, uh, I don't know, two, three, five. We have three, four, five. These all contain five. So that's one way to, like, the, that's kind of half the subsets. And then you also have the length k subsets that don't have the five in it. Length k subsets that don't contain that value that you're splitting on. And it could have been any of them. We'll just call it the five for this example. And so that's like your, your one, two, three. There's no five in the subset. That's your uh, two, three, four. It's your, I don't know. Are there any others? One, three, four. There's plenty. And so all these, like there's a bunch that don't have the five and there's a bunch that do have the five and they're all of length three. You can split on a value like that. And it's like you, you build this set and you build this set and these two taken together are all the length three subsets. Does that make sense? That is that is a proof that you can make very precise. These these must be all the length subsets. Even there, either there's a five or there isn't a five. And so that is the proof. All right. You can break down the length k subsets of set A into all of the length k subsets of A that contain the five. And so that's well, if you've chosen to put a five in your in each set, really you're picking from the rest of the one through four now, you're picking from n minus one things, and you are picking uh, how many things, you're picking not three, but two now, you've picked the five. So you're picking k minus one things. So it's n minus one, choose k minus one, and you add that to all the subsets that don't contain a n. And so you're making all the size three subsets of the set just one through four, because you're not considering the five over here. And so, Again, you're choosing from a smaller set now, just from one to four, but you're choosing all k things still, because you still have uh, k things to take. You haven't just taken the five yet. And that's that's legitimately it. That's the proof. So I hope that makes sense. It was, uh, this was an arbitrary element. A and was an arbitrary element. And so you can make this a bit more precise. This was just an example, though, but I think it's a, it's a pretty convincing example. Okay, so with that in mind, let me have you try some of this. This is just going to be using uh, the identity. Uh, you don't have to like make the final answer. You can just leave it in the blank choose blank form if you'd like. But all right, here is a, a binomial. 3x minus 4y. Now we have coefficients. Ooh, uh, 3x minus 4y to the eighth power. And so what is the coefficient in front of x to the fifth and y to the third in this expansion? All right, so here is, oh gosh, where is it? Here is the formula again. Here's the coefficient for blank to the blank, blank to the blank. Uh, see if you can figure it out. You can use either of these. But like, what is A, what is B? Now you have coefficients to worry about as well. So uh, remember that you're not just taking an X every time you take an X, you're taking three X, and that's gonna multiply together. All right, so. If you've taken x five times and y three times, calculate this one. And then here's another one with some negatives in, in play. Uh, what is the coefficient of x to the sixth, y to the first in this one? All right, so give those both a try. And let me uh, show you what I would do, what I would think about. So if x, x to the fifth, y to the third. So the five plus three, of course, adds up to eight. And we could think about this in a couple different ways. But the coefficient that we care about is, well, it's n choose. Uh, let's say that the, the x was first, so this could be our k, n choose k. So that's going to be a coefficient. What is, so n is 8. And the thing at the front is a 5, so let's call the k 5. And so that's going to be 8 choose 5 times you know x to the fifth, y to the third. But every time we take an x, remember, we take three. So if I'm taking five x's, I've really taken three five times as well. And so there's a three to the fifth out in front. 
I hope you remember that. And then uh, every time I take a y, I take negative 4 as well. So if I have three y's, I'm taking negative 4 three times as well. So that's, that's the full coefficient. Do we see that? That's the idea. And it's really like a in our example. So this has a inside of it, right? The, what is a and what is b? It's really, think of it this way. A is not x, it's 3x. B is not just y, it's negative 4y. You see that? That's the goal. All right, so this is, that's that one. And then uh, let's figure out this one. All right, so we have uh, x and y, x to the sixth power. So uh, it looks like we have 7, that's our n. And then 6 is the coefficient at the front of this guy. And so it's going to be 7, choose 6 times, you know, your x to the sixth times y to the first. But all right, every time I took an x, I take negative 2 of them. And I got 6 of them. So negative 2 to the sixth times uh, negative 5 to the first. So every time I took a y, I took negative 5 of them All right, to the first power. And so this is the coefficient. That's the correct answer. It's not just the 7 choose 6, because there are coefficients here. So don't forget about those on a test. All right, hopefully that made a little bit of sense. I, I assume you've seen this before. We're just like hitting it harder uh, or just reviewing it from you know your algebra class that you've seen that before in. And so that's that. I think I have one last main topic for these slides, and then uh, we'll wrap up and get ready for the next lecture. So this is called the pigeonhole principle, which is a very cute name. And you think about it as if there are birds trying to like make their nests or live in little holes that you've built. You've, you've built a pigeon mansion or something. And so here's the pigeonhole principle. If you have n plus one pigeons, Right? and there are n boxes or n little pigeon holes for them to live in, then if you know there's n plus one of them and there's n holes, then there must be at least one box with more than one pigeon. Does that make sense? It's like, all right. I don't know. Let's see here. Uh, for example, let's say we have One, two, three, four, five, six, seven pigeons, or seven, seven pigeon holes. You can label them. Three, four, five, six. Uh, I guess there are eight. Whatever. Uh, let's say we have eight pigeon holes and nine pigeons. Well, they could all be having a party in box one. Of course, there's more than one box. There's at least one box with more than one pigeon, if that's true. Or if you try to spread them out as much as possible, you have nine pigeons. You could put one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. That's eight pigeons. And if you spread them out as much as possible, but there's nine, you know there's nine sitting in these boxes, then there must be at least one with overlap. That's as, like, that's as far as you can spread them out. It's like you're trying to, I don't know, you've got a bunch of things and you're trying to shove them into, like you're trying to f shove four things into three holes. There has to be overlap. That's all the pigeonhole principle is, but it turns out to be very powerful. And hopefully it's kind of obvious. Well, let's prove it. Let's prove the pigeonhole principle by contradiction. And so assume like uh, this is our theorem, right? If n, n plus 1 pigeons are placed in n boxes, then there must be at least one box with more than one pigeon. By contradiction, let's assume that there aren't. Let's assume that there's at least uh, that every box has less than or equal to one pigeon if there's not any with more. So for a contradiction, assume each box has less than or equal to one pigeon. Then the max number of pigeons in the boxes, uh, the number of pigeons is, well, there can be at most one in every box. So uh, it's number of pigeons is less than or equal to one times the n pigeons. But we said that there are n plus one pigeons. But n plus 1 is greater than the n that you say that there can be at most in this box, which is a contradiction QED. OK? That's the idea. So uh, yeah, that is the proof for the pigeonhole principle. And it's really formally defined like this. Like there are functions. Like you've got a function from a set of size 4 to a set of size 3. There must be overlap. There must be overlap. That's the idea. 
Uh, but this is quite powerful. And let's let's show some examples of them. You get some cool word problems out of the pigeonhole principle, which is nice, a nice breath of fresh, fresh air. So uh, for example, if you have a drawer and you know that there's three different kinds of socks in that drawer, but um, you are, uh, you're weird and you don't like to pair up your socks, then in the worst case, if you grab a sock at a time with a blindfold on, then you, by the pigeonhole principle, you have to take out four socks to, to guarantee the fact that you got a matching pair. I hope that makes sense. And so like here is your, let's draw your drawer of a bunch of socks. Like you got a pair, you got a sock one, here's another sock one, sock two. You don't know where they are, but there's, they come in pairs, you just didn't pair them up. And so you're just gonna grab blindly into your drawer in the worst case, how many socks do you need to take out to get, to guarantee a pair of somebody, uh, like a pair of two, two of the same kind? Well, in the worst case, like the first thing you take out is sock one, the second sock you take out is sock two, the third sock you take out is sock three. They're all different, but there's only three kinds. So the next one you are guaranteed better be one of the ones you got before. And so uh, now you finally have a matching pair. That's the pigeonhole principle. It's kind of nice. And then here is the world's coolest proof. One of the coolest things I get to tell you. Uh, counting is a very cool idea. And I, there are some fun examples. I think this is probably the best example of the slides. Uh, there exists, there are, there are three people in Fresno that are not bald, by the way. There must be, there are guaranteed to be three people in Fresno with the exact same number of hairs on their head, which is very surprising. But we can prove this. I can't tell you who they are, of course, but this is a fact, all right? And it comes from these two facts, these two ideas. The number of hairs on somebody's head is uh, no more than 200,000, surprisingly. That's, that's as many hairs as you get on a person's head. And well, Fresno has a population of over 500,000. And so if everybody had a, if you tried to spread out as much as possible, all the people, to give them each a different number of hairs on their head. By the time you get to 200, you are forced to overlap. 200,000. You're forced to overlap, even if you're trying to keep it all spread out. And then once you get to 400,000, you must overlap some more, all the way to 500,000, some, and some change. So in the, in like the smallest case, there are three people somewhere with, uh, there's actually a few groups of three people, uh, perhaps. There are at least three people with the same number of hairs on their head, which is amazing. That's so cool. And the way that you can get this is because got 500,000 people. And if you're trying to spread them out in boxes, in 200,000 boxes, you're going to divide. And then uh, like it goes into a few times. And so it's like more than two. If you take the ceiling, because like, there is some stuff left over, maybe it doesn't go all the way to the end like it stops and so there is some overlap it is three the ceiling of this result is three isn't that so cool uh, and this works out because 500,000 over 200,000 is greater than two if you try to spread them out as much as possible give, give every uh, make sure everybody has a different amount of hairs on their head uh, you're still gonna have at least three people lining up with the same number isn't that amazing so uh, maybe you've run into your your hair number count duplicate person in Fresno. You never know. So that's a fun example of the pigeonhole principle. Um, here are some more examples and then I have a question for you. Uh, a couple questions before we go. All right, so, all right, here's some more fun counting examples. Let's say that we pick five cards from a deck. Uh, if you pick five cards by the pigeonhole principle, at least two must have the same suit. Right, so you like, you draw one card. In the worst case, like you draw clubs first, uh, spades second, hearts third, diamonds fourth, and so like you got every different kind in the worst case after four. But there's only four kinds of cards, only four suits, and so the next one must have another uh, example. Right, you pick the four different ones in the worst case. The fifth one must be a duplicate. You're, there's only four four suits. That's the worst case. It's always talking about the worst case in the pigeonhole principle. It might be more. You never know. Uh, and then finally, let's say that we pick 10. This is a fun one, too. If you pick 10 arbitrary two-digit numbers, so I don't know. This is, this gets a little weird. Pick 10 arbitrary two-digit numbers, like, I don't know, 15, 
and 87 and uh, 33, 21, like a bunch of different numbers. Pick 10 of them, 10 random two digit numbers, uh, like generate them. And there must be two subsets of those numbers of arbitrary size that have an equal sum, which is really cool to think about. So, uh, and the reason for this comes from the pigeonhole principle. There are, how many different subsets of these 10 numbers are there? It's two to the 10th power. There's 1,024 different subsets of all of these two digit numbers that you picked, at least 10 of them. It's that many subsets, like take maybe this one or this one. There's a bunch of different subsets. There's 1,024 of them. And then the set of possible sums of all your numbers, right? If you chose 0, 0, the sum is 0. If you chose all the way to 9, 9, if you chose 9, 9, 10 times, right? Or if you chose 0, 0 as all of your 10 numbers, or 9, 9 as all of your 10 numbers, like the smallest number, that you, smallest sum of your subset is 10 bunches of zeros, or 10 99s. And so the set of possible sums is 0 through 99 times 10, which is 990. That 1024, the number of subsets is greater than the number of possible sums. And so there must be some overlap on at least one sum. Isn't that cool? It's like, take these guys, add them with, uh, add them up, and then take these guys, also add them up. You will find the same sum. You're guaranteed there must be at least two subsets of those numbers that have the equal sum. That's kind of fun. All right, then finally, some questions for you. All right, so, okay, first one. How many people must be selected to make sure there are at least 20 who were born in the same month? So think about this, and trying to come up with a formula, I think, is the best way. So try that one first. We'll do these in order. All right, in the worst case, right, you want 20 people, like, like everybody's spread out as much as possible. You want 20 people who are born in the same month. So like you, if you pick the first, uh, I don't know, if you pick 12 people randomly, maybe it just so happens that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, there is a possibility that all 12 of the first 12 people you pick are born in different months. If you're in the very worst case, and they're all spread out as much as possible. In the worst case, it all happens like this, and like they're all spread out as much as possible. And if you want 20 people born in the same month, you have to take, well, 12 to make sure there's at least uh, somebody for every month, 12 more to make sure there's at least two people for some month, another 12 to make sure there's at least three people aligning with at least one month, and so on and so forth. You gotta do that, right? You gotta take 12, because that's as most as they could be spread out. Yeah, I take 19 of those, and th so this guarantees there are at least 19 people that share uh, a birthday month. And then you use the pigeonhole principle. You add just one more person, and they would have gone to one of these months, it's one of them, and that will make the 20th person for one of those months. See that? That's the worst case. And so really what we're looking for is the number n such that if you spread them all out by 12, you need a number uh, that's like, you're searching for all the n's such that this number is greater than or equal to 20, where you take the ceiling, by the way, okay? And so what we noticed was, uh, well, if you took 19 times 12 over 12, that guarantees that you got 19 people in every month. You yeah, add just one more, you got a little fraction over, that creates the 20th, the 20th person, the 20th overlap. All right, I hope that makes a little bit of sense. So that a ceiling is involved. Uh, let's see, yeah, kind of like this. All right, uh, here's another question for you. At least how many people in a group of 50 were born, must have been born in July? Did you get it? This one is a trick question. you can take an infinite amount of people and they might all be born in different months. Do you see that? There is no answer. You have a group of 50 people, yeah, there's no guarantee that any of them were born in July. Like, 
you take your giant group, maybe they're all born in August. Who knows? You have no clue. That's what the pigeonhole principle guarantees. It's, it's not precise. It's not precise about a certain month. It's just at least 20 were born in, in one month. I don't know which one it is, but one month there is overlap. I don't get to choose which one. Okay, so this is, watch out for that. You cannot pick. It's just got to be one, some. Okay, and then finally, uh, here is the population of California. It's about 40 million or so, probably more now. Uh, at least how many people have the same three initials. Let's pretend that everybody has three initials for the sake of this example. Pretend that everybody has like a middle name or some equivalent of a middle name. And so at least how many people have the same three initials? I'm gonna use the population of California and maybe all the different ways to make three initials. All right, so, okay, there's 40 million people in California. How many different initials could you have? Well, 26 characters for the, 26 characters for your first initial, 26 for your second, 26 for your third. So 26 to the third power is all the different numbers of initials you have. And if you wanted to spread these out as much as possible, like you give just one person AAA, one person AAB, all the way and all the way until there's overlap. And we want to see like how many in the, in the worst case, like how, what, what's the maximum we could have in the very worst case. And so we're gonna take the 40 million people and try and spread them out as much as possible among the 26 to the third power uh, answer. And then we take the ceiling of that because if there's anybody left over there is, uh, they are gonna be in some group. And that is the answer, whatever that is. That's how many people in California must have the same three initials. We can try and calculate that. Python 3. Divided by 26 to the third power. So there must be, uh, rounding up, 2,276 people in California, at least, with the same three initials. It's kind of cool. All right, so that's all that I got for us for, for this lecture. We are now finished with the counting slides, and I will see you in the next one.